Hilltop Productions presents a dramatic reading of Robot Wars by Sigmund Brewer. Book One, Death Trap, read to you by Nathan Hill. Chapter 8 Dice, as you can imagine, I have very little time for anything else but the oxygen problem. As it is, I can only fit five minutes into my schedule for you. I hope this meeting is as important as you insisted. Short and wide, Director Stephen has thick, wavy gray hair. He likes to run his hands through it as he talks. I think he does that because he likes to remind himself that he has way more hair than most people his age. He's over 60, and a lot of the 40 to 50 year old scientists are already going bald. Yes, sir, I said. I stayed very polite even though I'd been asking to see him all day. The more I thought about my theory, the more I knew I was right. All the oxygen problems could be solved. I think I might know what's wrong with the solar panels. Behind his desk, Director Steven leaned back in his chair. His office is the site of most entire mini-domes. He also has framed paintings of earth scenes like sunsets and mountains on his wall. No one else has paintings. Cargo's too expensive. So tell me, young Tice, what do you know that all our experts here don't know? By the tone of his voice, I knew right then that I should have had Rawling bring my idea to Director Steven. Rawling once told me that some people didn't like me simply because my unexpected birth here had taken time and resources that weren't planned. He had explained that Director Stevens was one of these people, especially because he acted like the entire Mars project was his. The trouble was, this far from Earth, with him as commander, it basically was his project. So everybody had to do what he said. Sir! I began. Now that I was here, it was too late to turn around. I don't think the problem is with the solar panels. I see, he said sarcastically, running his fingers through his hair. So it's just our imagination that the dome is running out of oxygen. It wasn't fair that he treated me like I was a stupid kid. Not when I'd been forced to think and act like all the adults around me for as long as I could remember. If any of the adults in the dome had come in, Director Stephen would have at least would have had to listen to them with respect. But I knew I couldn't say this, of course, or he'd get mad at me and tell me to leave. My point was too important. What I mean, I said as firmly as I could, is that the techies have taken the solar panel down twice from the railings and found absolutely nothing wrong with them. Thank you for telling me something I already know. You now have three minutes of my time left. I tried to keep a polite smile on my face. If it's not the panels that are broken in some way, then maybe the problem is the sunlight. This is good, very good. It is? You have been kind enough to help me understand this completely. Now I've discovered we have to fix the sun! Sir, that's not what I mean. What if there's something blocking the panels from getting the sun? Clouds? On Mars? Hardly. There's no atmosphere. Although that's our goal, we still haven't found even enough plants that will survive out there long enough to begin to create an atmosphere. What about the dome itself? I asked. In my virtual reality program computer sessions, the protective visors get scratched because of sandstorms. Maybe over the years the Martian sand has done that to the dome, and the sunlight is getting through. Director Stevens stood abruptly and strode out from behind his desk. In his white lab coat, he appeared even larger than he was. From my wheelchair, I had to lean my head back to look up at him. I hated doing that because it made me feel small and weak. Do you think that we are stupid? Do you think when we designed this project we didn't think of that? The glass of this dome is as hard as diamonds. It was made to withstand the impact of small asteroids. A million years from now, this glass will still be as clear as the day it was made. I, I, I was only trying to help, I said. You think you know all the answers, he said, his face red and furious. Instead, you know nothing. He leaned down in front of me and stared close in, closely into my face. Dr. McTire keeps me informed of your progress in the virtual reality program, you know. He told me how you failed yesterday. Have the scientists attacked you instead of letting you lead all of them across the plains in a sandstorm? And let me tell you why. It's because you didn't bother to explain how you could do it. You just assumed if you told them something, that was the way it was and they should listen. You should have learned yesterday that that technique doesn't work. Before you wasted my time today, you're supposed to be smarter than that. Or are you? 
I kept my head as steady as I could. I knew nothing I could say would make a difference. I should have known better than try to talk to Director Steven on my own. I should have remembered that he'd made it clear on numerous occasions that he couldn't be bothered by me, and that my presence alone under the dome had already bothered him enough over the years. Director Steven's cold blue eyes bored into mine. Now please leave he said flatly. I have better things to do than let some teenager tell me how to run my project. I went. Slowly. My wheelchair seemed like it was glued in place. Were my arms that dead already from lack of oxygen? I'm not sure if I cared. My ears burned from anger and embarrassment. Why did Director Steven seem to bristle every time he saw me? Did he dislike me that much? And if so, why? Was there something wrong with me? Chapter 9 That night, after a very quiet and short supper, I decided to go up to the third deck where the telescope was, because I wanted to be alone. The main level of the dome held the mini-domes and the labs. One level up, a walkway about ten feet wide circled the inside of the dome walls. People mostly used the walkway for exercise, jogging in circles above the main floor below. Not me, of course. The techies had built a ramp for my wheelchair, and the only reason I ever went to the second level was to reach the third and smallest level of the dome, which anyone, including me in the wheelchair, could reach by a narrow catwalk from the second level. The third level was centered at the top of the dome. The floor of it was a circle only 15 feet wide. It hung directly below the ceiling, above the exact middle of the main level. Here on the deck of the third level, a powerful telescope was perched beneath a round bubble of clear thick glass that stuck up from the black glass that made up the rest of the dome. From there, the massive telescope gave me an incredible view of the solar system. It was getting more and more difficult to push my wheelchair, and I needed to stop for breath a couple of times. Each gasp I took reminded me of how little time was left before oxygen ran out. I wondered if I was breaking the new rule about resting to save oxygen. No one was jogging on the walkway. Below me, as I slowly wheeled up the catwalk, it was quiet on the main level of the dome. Most people were inside their mini-domes, but I decided that if I didn't have long to live, I didn't want to waste time I could spend at the telescope. Tonight, I not only wanted to take my mind off the oxygen problem in this death trap, but I wanted to forget what Director Steven had said to me. Maybe I did think I was too smart. Maybe I did bug people. Wondering about all that and thinking about how useless and young he thought I was, I didn't like myself much either. The best way to escape the dome and myself was with the telescope on the third level. Because of my crippled body, it wasn't able to take me places, but at least my eyes and mind and imagination could. For me, the telescope was freedom. Something that let me travel a billion miles across the universe with a single sweep across the sky. I rolled into place at the eyepiece of the telescope where the dome astronomer usually sat. I allowed myself a sad smile as I lifted my hands to the controls. The one good thing about useless legs was that you never needed to look for a chair. I let out a deep breath as I reached the telescope controls. The power to the computer controls of the telescope was down as part of the director's energy saving program. But I know how to find different stars and planets without the computer map. After all, the solar system was my backyard. I brought the telescope into focus. The black of the universe and the brightness of the millions and millions of stars hit me with incredible clearness. It was a clearness no one would ever see on Earth, where the air and clouds and the particles of pollution take away the sharpness of telescopes. But not on Mars, which nearly has no atmosphere. When you sit at the telescope, it feels like you can reach out and grab the stars. In the next 30 seconds, Terror and panic passed by me. To anyone under the dome, that was an old joke. The names of the two moons of Mars are Deimos and Phobos. These Greek names translate to terror and panic because Mars was named after an ancient god of war. But don't think of these moons like the ones that circle Earth. Deimos and Phobos are tiny moons, chunks of rock not even 20 miles across. They're lumpy, not round, and they look like potatoes with craters. To us on Mars, Deimos rises in the east and sets in the west. Phobos rises in the west and sets in the east. They move across the sky in opposite directions. I never got tired of watching one moon pass by the other. Tonight, though, I wasn't on the telescope deck to moon watch. I wanted to see the planet Earth. I turned the controls and fine-tuned the focus. There it was. A beautiful blue ball streaked with swirling white of storms across the face of it. And behind it, 
the round white moon, bouncing the sunlight and redirecting it here to Mars. I smiled sadly again. The two hundred of us here on Mars were so far away, so alone in the vast solar system. To me, the Earth of DVD Gigarum seemed so foreign but nice. A place of people laughing and crying and falling in love and having picnics in parks and watching the sunset behind mountains and crossing oceans and flying through the air on planes. Because of the oxygen problem, I'd never have a chance to see any of that. Or any of the incredible things about living on a planet that Mom says God designed to make the existence of humans possible. I blinked and went back to the telescope, thinking about what I'd never see. I wanted to cry. But I wouldn't allow myself to do it. Because out of all people under this dome, I was the only kid and used to being alone. I'd learned early on not to cry, even when I felt like it. I'd learned early that I'd have to fend for myself, other than my mom and Rawling, Nobody in the colony paid much attention to me. I stared at the earth and the moon hanging in the back of a universe that was so big, no human mind could truly understand its size. I sat there a long time, thinking and wondering and feeling sad thoughts. Then someone tapped my shoulder. It scared me so badly that I would have jumped out of my wheelchair if my legs had worked. Relax, Tice, Rowling said. It's only me. I had thought I'd find you here. Yeah, I said, my heart still pounding. You did. Look, he said in a strange tone, we've got to talk. It's about a secret your mom and I have kept from you for a long, long time. Chapter 10 Below us it was dim. Shadows darkened the row of plants. The mini domes looked like black eggs rising from the ground. Only the hum of the electrical generators broke the silence. And too soon, when all electricity died, there to be no noise at all. Outside the dome, Rolling started to say in a low voice. He had pulled a chair near the telescope and sat in it facing me directly so our eyes were at the same height. What does it take for a human to survive outside the dome? I thought you were going to tell me outside the dome, he said again. What does it take for a human to survive? He spoke firmly, like he was quizzing me and wasn't going to say another thing until I answered. With or without a covered platform buggy? I asked. The Mars Project has two of them. These monstrous machines ride on huge rubber tires that don't sink in the Martian sand because gravity is less here than on Earth. I've seen photos of cars and platform buggies look nothing like them. The buggies are simply four wheels that support a deck. On the bottom of the deck are the electric engine and storage compartments. On top is a miniature dome similar in shape to an igloo which covers the driver and passenger, and can hold up to ten people. A small tunnel sticks out from the mini-dome onto an open portion of the deck where a ladder almost reaches the ground. This tunnel has two entrances to allow people to get in and out of the platform buggy when it's on the surface of Mars. The outside entrance is sealed as someone steps from the inner entrance to the tunnel. When the inner entrance is sealed before the outer entrance opens, in this way, little oxygen escapes the platform buggy's mini-dome. The big entrance of this space station's dome works this way, too. Without, Rawlings said. You know how expensive the platform buggies are. They take a lot of room and cargo, cost millions to produce, and consume too much valuable energy when we run them. What does it take for a human to survive outside the dome without a platform buggy? Humans need oxygen and water and protection from the heat and cold. How do they get all that now? Big, bulky spacesuits, I said and whatever oxygen and water each person can carry. How long can a human last out there until he or she needs to return to the dome? Supposedly a day, I said. Only a day. But that's why we're here, to get the planet ready for humans to live outside the dome. So that later, later is a hundred or two hundred years away. Meanwhile, the entire planet needs to be explored. Do you really have a secret, or are you doing this just to keep me interested? Rowling didn't smile. Machines. Robots. They don't need oxygen or water or heat. They don't take up a lot of cargo space on ships. For the cost of one platform buggy, you can have a hundred robots. Robots are ideal except for one thing. He paused. Robots don't have human brains. A computer as big as a spaceship can't think and react the way a human can. So we can't begin to send robots to explore the planet unless they are controlled by and think like humans. 
Are you with me so far? Yes, but it hasn't been much of a secret. You said, tell me what you know about Earth labs that grow skin and bone for people. What does this have to do with tell me? Sure, I'll tell you, I said. You and Mom make me study it as part of a school assignment. So you understand that 50 years ago, burn victims had no chance of healing their skin. But now doctors can take the piece of the victim's skin and grow it into big patches just like growing a plant, and then replace the damaged skin with the new skin. Yes, I know. Remember? You made me study it for three months, as you know about replacement bones and replacement organs and how far that has come since the year 2000, and that doctors have learned to grow biological plastics right inside the body? They have used steel and cable to rebuild joints. They found ways to join all sorts of artificial materials in human body parts. Yes, 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 I said, trying hard not to get impatient. Come on, what's the secret? Put it together, Rowling said slowly and quietly. The need for robots with human brains, along with advances in medicine. Add one more thing, then you'll have your secret. Chapter 11 One more thing. I don't get it. Virtual reality, Rowling said. You've been in that robot simulation program two hours a day since you were eight years old. Tell me what you know about virtual reality. Well, I put on the surround sight helmet. It gives me a 3D view of the scene on a computer program. The helmet is wired, so when I turn my head, it directs the computer program to shift the scene as if I were there in real life. Or in the case of the robot training, it shifts to whatever video lens I want, giving me the chance to see in four directions, one direction at a time. Go on, Rawlings said. Sounds come in like real sounds. Because I'm wearing a wired jacket and gloves, the arms and hands I see on the surround sight picture move whenever I move my own arms and hands. Good, he said. Good? I'll bet any five-year-old Earth kid knows this stuff. What about this secret? Will you agree with me that the virtual reality helmet and jacket are just extensions of your brain? He must have seen my puzzled look. He pointed at the telescope. Just like this is an extension of your brain. You can't actually be on a moon of Jupiter, but the telescope lets your eyes go there, and your eyes show you the moon to your brain. That's different, I said. A moon of Jupiter is real. Virtual reality is just a computer program. Your brain doesn't know the difference. Not unless you tell your brain with your thoughts. Rawling, if you're trying to confuse me, it's working. Stick with me. This is important. Does your brain see? I thought about it. No. My eyes see. You got it. Your eyes deliver information to your brain. When you look through the telescope, your optic nerves take the image and fire it into your brain. Your brain translates the information, what your brain doesn't see. It relies on the extensions of the brain, your eyes, your telescope, or the extension of virtual reality. I was beginning to understand. Your brain doesn't see anything, Rowling said. It doesn't hear anything. It doesn't smell anything. It doesn't taste anything. It doesn't feel anything. Your brain is this incredible jumble of stuff packed into your skull that translates the information delivered to it by nerve endings. Some nerve endings are attached to the back of your eyes or your ear canals, to sensors in your nose or on your tongue, to nerve endings in your skin and bones. In other words, I said, you're telling me the body is like a virtual reality suit wrapped around the brain. Exactly! He smiled. After all, it's like God designed an amazing 24 hour a day virtual reality suit that moves on two legs, has two arms to pick things up, can feed and repair itself, and is equipped to give information through all five senses. Except, instead of taking you through virtual reality, a made-up world, your body takes you through the real world. I never thought of it that way, I said, but I'll agree with you. Now will you finally tell me the secret? Soon, Rowling said, but give me one more minute. One minute. It takes time for the brain to learn how to handle all the information delivered by the body, he said, excitedly falling into the teacher role. For proof, all you need to do is watch a baby as it grows. Babies are clumsy and don't know how to work their bodies, or to understand the sights and sounds that their eyes and ears deliver to their new brains. But slowly their brains figure out what information is being delivered, and babies begin to understand the world around them through the nerves of their eyes and ears, and nose and tongue and skin. I know, I know, I said. 
For my first two years in controlling a virtual reality robot in the computer program, you always laughed and said that except for smelly diapers, I was like a newborn baby. Because you were, Rowling said. Your brain was learning to translate new information. Only this new information didn't come from your body, but from the virtual reality equipment, which was just like the extension of your body. You were clumsy at first, but quickly you got better until you now handle that virtual reality robot just like it were your own body. Learning those controls is like learning the controls of a complicated computer game. He took a deep breath. <sighs> so, you're still with me after all that? Yes. Rowling took another deep breath. <sighs> Let me ask you this. If the information was delivered instantly, would it make a difference to your brain if the information reached it through eyes attached to your head or eyes attached to a video lens a thousand miles or a million miles away? It would, I said after thinking about it for a few seconds, because your hands have to be near your eyes to pick something up. What if your hands were also a thousand miles or a million miles away? Ha <laughs> ha, I know your secret. You're crazy, like anyone could have arms a million miles long. I'm serious, he said. It's the brain that matters and how it deals with the information. If your eyes, ears, and hands are just extensions of your brain, it doesn't matter how far away all those parts are, as long as two things are possible. First, these extensions instantly deliver information to the brain, and second, the brain is instantly able to direct the extensions. Would you agree with me? I looked at Rawling strangely. He was waiting as if my answer was very important. Well, I guess you're right. It wouldn't matter. If it doesn't matter, you could explore Mars. You could go out to the asteroids. You could see a moon of Jupiter, not by telescope, but actually being there through extensions of your eyes and ears and the rest of your senses in the body of a robot. Would you like that? No, I hate this wheelchair, I said. But what you're talking about, that can't happen. It's only theory. Rowling looked up through the dome at the stars, then back at me. It's no longer theory. It's you. Chapter 12 I promised your mother I wouldn't say anything else until we got together with her, Rowling said as he got out of his chair. She's waiting for us in your mini dome. You can't leave me hanging like this. It won't be long, he said. Let me get you down there. Normally, I didn't let anyone push my wheelchair. I mean, did other people ask for help when they walked? This time, though, I was too distracted, wondering about what Rowling had just told me. Rowling wheeled me away from the telescope and took us down the catwalk to the second level. As he pushed me along the second level walkway, he grunted. Mm, you must be getting heavier, he said. I don't remember it being this difficult to move you around. Lack of oxygen, I said. It's been getting tougher and tougher for me to wheel around, too. But now I didn't care about that. I wanted to know more about the virtual reality program. Will you at least give me a hint about this robot stuff? You won't have to wait long. Trust me, for as long as this secret has been inside you, another few minutes won't matter. Inside me? Inside you. But I won't say another word until we have meet your mother. He kept pushing. When we reached the ramp, he guided me down to the main level. In another couple of minutes, we met my mother in a mini-dome. An x-ray of your back and shoulders. From this afternoon's checkup, I glanced up at him. He sat in one chair on the other side of the mini dome's common area. Mom sat on another. First of all, Rowling began, you should know that we weren't going to tell you this until you were 18, the age of legal adulthood on Earth. A long time ago, it was decided when you reached that age, you would be given the choice to go ahead with this experiment or not. Except now, with the dome losing oxygen, he didn't have to finish for me. What he meant was, is I wouldn't reach my 18th birthday. Anyway, look at the x-ray. I did. Opening the envelope and holding the sheet up to the light, the bones were gray-white against the darker film of the x-ray sheet. I could easily see the collar bones and shoulder blades and the top of my spinal column and the bottom of my skull. See where your neck is? You'll have to look closely. See that short, dark rod, hardly thicker than a needle? I squinted at the x-ray and finally nodded. It was wedged directly into my spinal column at the bottom of my neck, just above the top of my shoulder blades. It looked like thousands of tiny hairs stuck out of the end of the needle into the middle of my spinal column. That's been there since you were a year old, Rowling said. What is it? I asked. How did it get there? Mom spoke very quietly. 
It got there because of an operation. I agreed to let them attach to your spine. It was a very difficult decision when I struggled with making. In the end, I felt like I had no choice. I hope you will forgive me. Forgive you? But... Tice, it's made things very hard here at the Dome when we discovered I was going to have a baby. Everything for the project had been planned to the last detail. You weren't one of those details. Directory Steven was furious, but he could not send me back. They needed a planned biologist too badly to begin experimental work on hybrids for Mars. If I went back to Earth with the time it takes to travel back and forth, it would put them years behind as though waiting for a replacement. Director Steven threatened to send you back as soon as you were born, but I knew the journey in the spaceship would kill you. Babies cannot handle G-force and orbit shifts, so when he offered me a trade, I accepted it. Her gaze lowered to her hands. A trade? Remember I loved you too much to send you away and risk your death. A trade? Mom hesitated. Director Steven said everything on the Dome project needed to have a purpose, including you. So I agreed to operation on your spine. The next ship brought the neurosurgeon and all the experimental equipment needed. After the operation, the neurosurgeon went out on the next flight. He was paid six years salary for all the time he spent in travel. As a part of a long-term plan, scientists had been hoping to use robots to explore Mars and do work that humans could base on virtual reality expeditions. The next stage in their experiment was to hook up a human's nervous system directly into the robot's computer drive. They were hoping a human brain could control the robot. Me? As part of the long-term plan, scientists had been hoping to use robots to explore Mars and do work that humans couldn't based on virtual reality extensions. The next stage in their experiments was to hook up the human nervous system directly into a robot's computer drive. They were hoping a human brain could control the robot. In a flash, I understood why Rawling had always examined my back so closely during checkups. Why he'd been worried about my back after I fell out of the wheelchair the night before. Why he'd spent two hours a day since I was eight Earth years old training me in the virtual reality robot program. Why Mom and Rowling had made me learn everything possible about human implants. The needle in my back, I queried holding up the x-ray against the light. All those things at the end of the needle that look like fine hairs, those are biological implants that have grown into my nerves. Mom and Rowling nodded. Plastic fibers with a core that transmits tiny impulses of electricity, Rawling said. You are the first person to get this implant. They had it planned on trying it on a human on Mars for at least another ten years. Wow! I couldn't keep excitement on my voice. If I was right. And the end of the needle coming out of my spinal column, it will attach directly into a computer input, right? Again, they nodded. It will take a painless minor operation to cut open the skin and add an antenna plug to the needle, Rawling said. It will barely stick out of your back. Double wow, I said. Now everything Rawling had just talked about at the telescope made sense. The need for robots powered by human brains, medical advances over the last 50 years, virtual reality extensions of the human brain. You mean I can be hooked up to a robot? If it works, Rawling said flatly, but he didn't seem happy. Remember, no one has tried this before. My mind raced. The senses of the robot would be an extension of my body. Just by using my brain, I'll be able to travel without my wheelchair. I'm going to be the one to revolutionize space exploration. The places I could go in a robot's body are limitless. I can... I can... Tears rolled down Mom's face. I don't get it, I said puzzled. This is great news. What is there to forgive you for? Mom didn't wipe away the tears. Tice, I'd like to eat one thing. Since you were old enough to talk, and it's pained me to do so. I have agnetized over this decision ever since wondering if I made the right one leading my baby become an experiment. I stared at her. I didn't understand. So. Here's the truth. You did not lose your leg, 
because of the way you were born. It happened during the operation. <laughs>